Well, good morning, good day, Epiphany Church. Uh, it is Psalm 34 that drives me today. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises will continuously be in my mouth. It is so good to be virtually gathered with God's people, uh, celebrating the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, as always, as my weekly uh, responsibilities go, I have the great privilege of unpacking the Word of God, and uh, I literally want to cut out the small talk and jump right to it. So grab your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 12. As you go there, uh, if you'll just let somebody know that we are live. Also, I hope you guys greeted each other. You know, we throw up that 30-second greeting, and I, I don't know if you guys are, are actually saying good morning. I, I, I've seen you guys say it when people pop in. Uh, but if you see a name that you don't know, if you just do me a favor and just welcome them and let them know that we are grateful that they are hanging out with us uh, today. Uh, we are coming off of the heels of a week of fasting. This past week has been a week where we have turned off our devices and as much as we could, we opted out of extra scrolling on social media and We've turned our plates down and really tried to press into the Lord as much as we could. And <clears throat> honestly, man, th th this week I pray that it was a turning point for many of you as it relates to your spiritual walk. Uh, the verse that has dr driven us all week is Isaiah 43. Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of a whole. Behold, I am doing something new. And it is that newness that I am praying that God would establish in your homes and in your hearts. And whatever that is, I, I pray that uh, God would really reveal it and expose it so that you can just continue to grow in your faith and grow in him. And apparently this, this was an important week for us to fast. It has been a chaotic and a crazy week. In fact, Monday morning at 6 a.m. we kicked off our fast. And uh, it's, it's, it's not by accident that we were praying for uh, the nation and we were praying for the elected officials and we were praying for the new administration only to find out uh, that Wednesday a crazy um, what I would call domestic terrorists jumped into the Capitol and began to take it over. And uh, while um, we had joint sessions in Congress uh, and, you know, the violence that erupted, I just want to be clear with you that it was uh, pure evil and leadership needs to step in to continue to restore and try to bring some, some type of stability. You know, I'm thinking about Acts chapter 19. I don't know if you ever read Acts 19 where a riot took place in, in, in Ephesus. The Bible says that it was different reasons, but uh, the whole city was erupted and uh, they were about to be charged for rioting. And a city clerk in verse 35, the Bible says that a city clerk is the one that called everybody together and calmed everyone down. And that city clerk said that we're in danger of being charged for rioting since we have no cause that justifies this type of commotion. And then he dispersed everybody and uh, it's something about a, a leadership being able to step in to calm things down. So as God's body, as believers, that is what we are called to do is pray for peace and pray uh, for restoration in the nation that we live. Remember Jeremiah 29, in its, uh, in its welfare, you'll find your own welfare. And so uh, let's continue to pray for this nation and pray for this uh, country. Uh, but today we are back in the book of Romans. We are in Romans chapter 12. We, we've been going through a journey since last year. We've been going, we kicked it back up um, a few weeks ago, but we have been going through a journey in the book of Romans. And uh, man, I don't know about you guys, but I've been enjoying, it, enjoying our time in Romans. There's something about going through a book of the Bible together where, you know, it stops us from being able to pick and choose our favorite scriptures, but we actually have to engage with every passage that is in front of us, and today is no exception. So won't you do me a favor and pick me up in verse 13, actually verse 3, verse 3, uh, we are in Romans 12. I'm going to jump right in. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we are many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another having gifts that vary according to the grace given to us. Underline these next four words. Let us use them. Talking about the gifts. If prophecy in the proportion of our faith, if service in our serving, 
the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. I want to preach today from the topic, which really is posed as a question. Where do you fit in the body? Let me, let me say that question one more time. Where do you fit within the body? Let's look to the Lord before we dig in. Uh, Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. And your word is a light unto our path. And today, oh God, we need you to illuminate 2021 for us, illuminate our lives for us, illuminate this week for us, illuminate that decision that has to be made. So we pray that we would run to your word because your word is sharper than any double-edged sword. And I pray that today you would perform spiritual surgery on our hearts as we talk about our gifts and our involvement in the community and how we engage with the body. We thank you, oh God, that you don't leave us aimlessly, but you give us your word to give us direction. So would you do so today as we try to figure out where we fit within the body? It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Christmas was a few weeks ago, and um, man, you know, I, I realized this past Christmas that my boys are getting older. You saw my oldest son. My, my youngest son wasn't here today, but you saw my oldest son today doing uh, the morning welcome. Um, but I realized this past Christmas that they got, they're getting older, and I realized it based on their gift selection, the things that they ask for for Christmas now, uh, it, it's funny, you know, they ask for gifts now that they actually use. Before when they were younger, they would ask for gifts that uh, they would get and, and, and they would have so many gifts that they would realize that they didn't want half of the gifts that they asked for. And so they wouldn't even play with half those gifts. In fact, I went in my son's room this morning while he was sleeping and I, I grabbed this. I don't know if you know what this is, but this is a, a Cosmo robot. Like Cosmo Robot was, was big a few years ago. In fact, when my wife and I, you know, my, my son asked for it, my oldest son asked for it, and my wife and I went around, this is how old it is, to Toys R Us. Back when Toys R Us actually was open and had physical locations, we ran around from Toys R Us to Toys R Us to Toys R Us to find this daggone expensive piece of toy. And, you know, at the time they were saying that this toy is the only toy that actually has a mind of its own. My son was begging for it. Please, can you find it? Can you find it? I, I really, that's what I want for Christmas. And so we went and we actually found it. And when we found it, we gave it to him and he was so excited. He played with it all Christmas morning and the next day he played with it. And it was shortly after that, somewhere about week one, week two, where we realized that he didn't play with it as much. Somewhere about a month later, we realized that it sat in the corner and never got played with again. In fact, when I got it out of my son's room this morning, I had, I had to dust it off because he hasn't played with that daggone thing in years. And it was expensive. You know, there's a feeling you have when you give a gift some, to someone and they accept the gift, but then they put it in the corner and they allow it to collect dust and they don't use it and they don't play with it. There's a feeling that you have. And I, I just wonder when God looks down from heaven at his body, I wonder if he looks at all of the gifts that he's put in all of his believers. And I wonder if he is watching us take our gifts and put them in the corner the way my son did this Cosmo robot and never, ever use them. Here's what I know about God. God has given his body wonderful gifts and many of us have ripped off the paper off the gift. We've looked at the gift. We might have even used it for a little bit, but then we put it somewhere and we have never used it again. And Paul is clearly concerned about that. So he picks up the pen to write an encouragement to the church at Rome to tell them, use the gifts that God has put inside of all of you. On Wednesday, we did a Bible study and, and I, I was talking to you about verses one and verse two. And in verse two, it was talking about how Paul was mentioning that, uh, verse one, that we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, present yourself totally to God, present all of who you are to God. And here's what I would argue today, that that includes your gift. 
Whatever it is that God put in you and every person that's logged on right now, every single one of you have a gift inside of you that God put in you specifically to do a few things. But the primary reason you have that gift is to strengthen the body. And you may be sitting on that gift right now. You may not know what that gift is. Maybe you do know what it is and you've been ignoring that gift. You haven't developed it. It is underdeveloped, but God wants to use it. Let me put a little Bible right here. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six, for this reason, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. And so Paul expects here that every believer will open the gift, use the gift in the context of biblical community in which we call the church. And today, Paul will show us how we should do it. And maybe you're logged on right now and you're like, I don't really know my gifts. I don't, I don't really know what I'm good at. I, I don't know how I'm wired. I'm still trying to figure things out. I, I would say by the end of this sermon, you should probably start to uh, have a better understanding of what your gift is. If not, you should have a better understanding of how to find out what your gift is. And we'll get a little bit practical toward the end of the sermon. And so Paul is pushing us today. He's going to push us to use our gifts, but he does so in the context of community. But before you come to community, he says there's a disposition that you have to have. That there's a certain attitude that you have to have when you come to community. Here it is, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but think with sober judgment. When God saved you and I, he does two things. He develops two different relationships. When God saves you, the first thing he develops is a relationship with him. But the second thing you're automatically are involved in is a relationship with brothers and sisters, people that you may not know you automatically become family with them, people that you normally would walk by in the street, people that you, you would see on the train and wouldn't even think about being friends with. People that you would ignore if you were in a room with them. Those people, if they have given their life to Jesus and you gave your life to Jesus, you are automatically in relationship with them. It is an oxymoron to be a Christian that's isolated. It is an oxymoron to be a Christian that says, I love Christ, but I don't love his body. You can't love Jesus and not love his body. They go together, that they coexist. But in order to functionally be a part of community, you have to come, according to Paul today, with humility. You got to understand something. If you want to be a part of the community, this, this thing only works when we actually join in and we're humble. Everyone can't come to the community and think that their way is the right way. Paul seems to understand the devastating consequence of pride within the community. And so before he talks about what your gifts are and how you bring your gifts to the body, the first thing he says is be humble. In humility, you know, I've heard it said humility is thinking less about yourself. And I, I understand what people are saying, but I, I would say it's not simply thinking less about yourself, but humility is thinking rightly about yourself. Humility is making the right uh, estimate of who you actually are. Humility is understanding that you by yourself ain't popping. Humility is understanding that you by yourself don't have it all together if it is not but the grace of God that when he uses you and you do something great, it is simply grace. It is not for you to become prideful or boastful or arrogant. We must come to the community. According to Paul today, we must come humbly. And Paul is not calling you to uh, depreciate yourself. He's calling you to understand that you by yourself ain't the total package. By yourself, you are not the community, but we all play different parts and we all come together. And so this call to humility is not just for some Christians. This call for humility is for all Christians. That means all of us must be humble because there's nothing worse than a prideful Christian. There is, there is nothing worse than a boastful leader. There is nothing worse 
than an arrogant pastor, a pastor that thinks that the local church revolves around him, a, a Christian that thinks that he is high and lifted up and, and is arrogant, a, a, a deacon that uh, thinks that he should get the praise for the church being uh, what it is. And the reality is God is like, none of y'all are in anything without me. All of y'all need humility because all of y'all are nothing if I don't lavish my grace on you. Do you think of yourself more highly than you ought to? Because Paul encourages us not to do that today. And one of the things I know about humility is humility, if done well within the context of community, actually can be a form of evangelism. Because one of the gripes that people have with the church, really two gripes that people have with the church is people will say, I don't want to go to the church because number one, they're too judgmental. And number two, they lack humility. They're arrogant in that building. They are prideful in that building. But we can change the perspective of non-believers if they come into the body and everybody is humble. Everybody is preferring others over themselves. Everyone is esteeming others' gifts and, and others' accomplishments. Nobody has entitlement issues and nobody wants special treatment. But all of us understand that we are kneeling at the throne of Christ Be humble is what Paul tells us today. And the church needs humility because not one of us has it all together. All of us need someone because we're all, we all have something that we can contribute to the body, but we all have something that we need from the body as well because we don't have it all together. And so Paul says today the same thing that Kendrick Lamar will say, be humble and sit down. So Paul says, look, before I give you any gifts, before I tell you that you need to operate with your gifts, you need to learn your gifts. He says, listen, first, just know that you ain't that dude. Come with humility. But then after he encourages them to be humble, he he, he describes the church in a very unique way. The ecclesia, the, 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 the community of believers, he describes us in a specific way. In verse four, he says, for as we are one, here it is body but we have many members and the members do not all have the same function verse 5 so though we are one body Paul describes the church today as a body we talked about this on Wednesday as well body in the Greek is soma he describes that the church is a body and that the at the head of that body is Jesus But if you look at your body, your body is made up of many different parts and none of them are supposed to function the same. My pinky is not supposed supposed to uh, act like my leg and my ear is not supposed to act like my shoulder. But all of the parts of my body are equally important. None of them are more important than another. They're all equally important. And the reality is if you think about your own body, your, your body is functioning best when everything on your body is functioning best, not just parts of your body. If I was in a bad car accident, God forbid, if I was in a bad car accident and I lost a leg in the car accident, I would be medically classified as handicapped. Just because I lost one part of my body, the totality of who I am is now classified as handicapped. Because I realized that a part of my body's not there, so that other parts now have to jump in and be stronger and be parts that they were never supposed to be. Same thing if I lost an eye in that same car accident, I would be considered visually impaired. And we know this about our physical bodies, but why is it that when it comes to the church or or the body of Christ, why is it that we're okay not contributing to the body? But if if a part of you didn't contribute to who you were, you would say something's wrong with me. You you would go to the doctor and say, "My my, my leg's numb and I can't move my leg, but yet we're okay with watching the body suffer, although we sit home and do nothing but log on to the stream. There, there's, no, there's no service we're giving. We're not completing the body. We're not helping the body. And when you're isolated from the body, it really does two things. The first thing it does is it stops you from spiritually growing. But the second thing that it does is it stops the church from being all that we could be. It stops us from being able to be a strong unit, a strong body, a body that's able to engage our neighborhood. Why don't you just wrestle with this question for a second, just for for a second. 
If you left the church, well, whatever church you're a part of, if you're a part of our church, think about, think about it in the context of Epiphany. If you left the local church, would the church hurt in any way by your absence? Just think about that. If, if you today said, I'm, I'm, I'm moving or I'm leaving, I'm, I'm not a part of the church, would we feel it? Because here's the honest reality. We should feel it. When you leave, we should feel like a part of our body left. During this pandemic, there, there have been many people that have, you know, moved away. New York is just a hard place to quarantine. It's overpopulated and it's expensive. So people have moved away and, you know, we, we've, we've encouraged them and blessed them and, and prayed for them and helped them with resources to get them on their way of wherever they're going. And there were some people that left. When they left, they were such an intricate part of the body. It hurt. I felt it. I, I, I sense the lack of their presence. Why? Because they were, a, they were a contributor to the body. And then there were some people that left that we didn't feel it at all. Can I be honest with you? And there's no shade, no shade at all, because I don't throw shade, especially in no daggone sermon. But this is the reality. There are some people that left that we actually got healthier when they left. Well, why is that? Because there, you, you ever had, you know, if a cancerous tumor grew on your body right now, it is growing and it is sucking nutrients from your body, but it is not giving anything to the body. And so when that thing is cut off, your body is actually healthier. Would we feel it if you decided not to be here anymore? And, and I, I know somebody sitting there going, how oh, are we in a pandemic, though? Pastor B, don't be challenging me today. Listen, I probably wouldn't have, to have preached this sermon if this didn't come up. But this is where God wants us today. How are you contributing to the body so that the body is stronger? Every one of you got a daggone gift. Every one of you. God is like, I'm glad you got gifts, but you got to come to the body humble, but you also got to come and unwrap that gift. Why do you take your gift and put it in the corner and let it collect, collect dust when the body needs it? This is a good moment for me to go ahead and put the call out. Listen, we need you, not post-pandemic. There are some of you that have giftings right now. Our worship team is in here every week. Our tech team is in here every week. We need people that, are, that, that, that can give us some time to be able to say, what can I do? And many of you have. I'm not beating you up today. M many of you have. And some of you I've seen and said, man, what, what can I do? I just don't even know where to fit in. And maybe that's a good next step for us is to, to show you guys some ways that we actually need help. Because Paul is encouraging all of us today, not post-pandemic, although we need you post-pandemic as well. But in the midst of right now in this season, because the church is not shut down, shut down how are we contributing to the body? And so he says here, the church, we're, we're one body. We're, we're made up of different members. And, and here's the thing about this. This text says the members don't all have the same function. So that means some of you are gifted to do, do things that I'm not gifted in. Some of you are able to to contribute in ways that nobody else can contribute. And the reality is we are hindered because you haven't contributed at all. Listen, everybody can't do the same thing. I'm not good at tech. Ed is great at tech. You know, we, we have a camera crew here. They know how to do the angles and they know how to, you know, did they know how to do the focus and make it quality, you know, so that you can be at home and watch the sermon. You know, Jeremiah saying today, Rob and Chris, uh, Lily and the worship team. I can't, I just can't do, that's not my gifting. Josh plays and, you know, has a band. That's not my gifting. But all of us have a gift. And the, I mean, the question I have for you is, are you operating in your gift? Because what we want to do is we want to go after the, the gifts that are how do I say this? The more visible gifts. But some of us, man, whatever the gift is, you just got to bring it. Let, let me see if I can make this plain. Uh, Josh is here. Let, let me invite Josh up real quick. And uh, I, I want to invite uh, somebody that can't play. Uh, Lameek, if you can come up real quick. Let me step up here for a second. If you could pan this cam camera over and come over and hang with me. So we have Lameek here. And uh, Lameek, I, I don't think you have the gifting of... Uh, of playing the keyboard, but um, if you were, thank you for hand sanitizing. If you were, um, if you were seeking to play the piano, even though that is not your gift, I, I want to show you how it hinders the church. Just do me a favor. Just play something the best of, no joke, the best of your ability. Just play. Just, just play. Just do your thing. 
the best of your ability. This is what, keep playing, this is what some of us sound like when we are playing and we're trying to operate in the gift that God has not given us. Okay, do me a favor. If y'all could switch for me real quick. Josh, if you'll do me a favor, I know it's going to be hard to do this, but to the best of your ability, don't worry about that, to the best of your ability, play the exact same thing Lamique just played. Now, Josh, do me a favor. Why don't you use your gifting that God gave you and play something that God put on your heart? Doesn't that just feel better? Doesn't that just sound better? When we are operating in the gift that God has called us to, we don't all have the same function, but when you operate in your gift, it's a beautiful melody. When all of us are contributing and doing whatever God has called us to do, this is what the church could sound like with beauty and, and splendor. And God is pleased right now because Josh is using his gift. Josh ain't behind the camera. Lamique ain't trying to play the piano where she was a few seconds ago, but she's not normally trying to play the piano. But when you operate in your gift and you bring it to the church, this is what it sounds like. The Bible says that we are one body with many members, and all the members don't have the same function. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 will say something similar. It says, for just as the body is one and has many members, for all members of the body, though many, are one body. When we're all operating with the gift that God has given us, we don't all play the same part. Here's a question that I asked at the top of the sermon. Where do you fit in the body? Where is your melody? What part of the body are you able to contribute in a way that would benefit the body? So Paul says, look, y'all got gifts. Y'all are sitting on them. Bring the gifts so that the church, so that the body can be edified, so that we can all be salt and light together. And so Paul says, you know what? You might be confused on what some of the gifts are. He doesn't list all the gifts here. But he says, let, let me give you a list of what some of the gifts are. And we'll land the plane as we kind of go through the gifts that Paul lays out here. Look at verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace that God has given us, let us use them. Okay, use what, Paul? If prophecy in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Paul right now lays out seven different gifts. This is not all of the gifts that God has given us, but he lays out seven different gifts I'll do this just in an academic way. I'll just walk through all seven real quick, and then we'll, we'll contemplate everything that God is telling us and try to figure out how we can fit in, and I'll let you guys go. The first gift that he talks about in verse 6 is the gift of prophecy. Prophecy is a gift that is given to certain individuals. Not everybody has the gift of prophecy. I love when I was talking to Gabriel on, on, uh, on Friday night at our testimony service, and he was actually praying about prophecy. I don't believe that prophecy has ceased. I believe that it's still for the edifying. Prophecy builds the church. Prophecy aligns us with what God is calling us to do. And prophecy is different than it, it, like the gift that we just saw with Josh. See, Josh has what's called a residential gift. Josh didn't wake up this morning and didn't know how to play. And he was like, God, you got to just teach me how to play. And then I got to, that's not how it works. He has a gift that stays with him. It's residential. It, it, it lives with him. I think the gift of teaching lives with you, but not prophecy. You don't wake up and say, hmm, I'm going to prophesy today. And you're probably going to be prophesying that day. You, you wake up and you say, God, I, I, I think you have a gift in me, but so use me to the best of your ability. And whenever God wants to, whenever the Holy Spirit wants to speak to the church, he'll speak to the church and he uses certain people. And you're not more spiritual than others because you have a very uh, visible gift like prophecy, but prophecy is one. We need more people prophesying in the church. 
We, we actually, when we were meeting together, we actually had a young lady that prophesied in the middle of one of our services. And by God's grace, it was so spot on. We need more people that have the gifting of prophecy. And I pray for it. I wonder if somebody out there has the gifting of prophecy, but, but you're like my oldest son that took Cosmo and put it in the corner. I wonder if some of you have that gift, but you haven't used it. If you think the pandemic stops prophecy, it doesn't. The second gift he names here is the gift of service. Serving is, 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 is straightforward. It has a broad sense of application. So service is, is encompassed, of course, with what our deacons do. De- deacons are st- by nature. That's what uh, deacon means is serving. But I would argue that deacons aren't the only ones that have the gift of serving. There are others that should be able to have the gift of serving. Every one of our staff members has, has the gift of serving. That, I mean, literally, we would not have been able to pull off Reset 2021 last week if we didn't have a group of people. You guys have no clue what it takes to bring a live stream to you, to bring a, 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 a Instagram live to you with quality and content. It takes a bunch of people that have the gift of serving. And so Paul says there's some of y'all got the gift to serve. Use it. Third, when he says the gift of teaching There has to be people in the church that have the ability to teach, not just teach, teach a dying Savior. Now, not just teach, but teach sound Orthodox Christianity. Teach biblical theology. You need a group of people that are able to teach to stop the church from eroding with false doctrine. The way you stop the church from eroding with false doctrine is making sure that you are constantly exposed to biblical theology. Teaching is one of the gifts that personally I feel most comfortable with. I'm not saying I'm the greatest teacher, but I'll say this. I've given my life to growing because I feel like that's one of the ways I can contribute to the body. What is one of the ways you can contribute? Some of you guys are looking at me right now preaching. You're going, I I could do that. And guess what? You probably could. And then there's another group of you that are looking and going, I would never stand up and teach in front of people. And guess what? You probably shouldn't. Because we all have different gifts, but teaching is a gift that God has given some of you. But then he moves on to teaching to something that almost seems synonymous, and that's exhortation. But exhortation, if you're asking the question, you should be, what is the difference between teaching and exhortation? There is a difference. In fact, if there wasn't, Paul wouldn't have listed two out. But exhortation is different than teaching. He does, he, he, he separates them again in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, where he says, Until I come for you, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. He separates teaching and exhortation. Teaching is more academic. Exhortation actually is the encouragement of the teaching. Exhortation is teaches to where it gets to your heart. And there is a difference because teaching can just be, I'm going to give you some information, but exhortation is going to help you to understand how to apply that information. We need more people that have the gift of encouragement, the gift of exhortation. You can edify the body by encouraging somebody that's down and telling them and showing them how they can actually love Jesus more. The fifth gift that he lists out is the gift of generosity. I hope you guys are tracking with me. I'm just kind of going through these gifts. The gift of generosity. Can you believe that generosity is actually a gift that the body can use? See, we want the gift of tongues. We want the gift of prophecy. We want the gift to be able to play the, 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 the piano and the keyboard. We want the gift of teaching. And we want these more visible gifts. But some of you have resources. And when you give it, you are exercising the gift of generosity. This is also why I say all the time, I'm never, ever, ever scared to ask you to contribute financially. I'm never scared to ask you for money. Despite the fact that you have seen the church abuse money, I am never scared to ask you because when I ask you to contribute, I am asking you to exercise the gift of generosity. A a good friend of mine uh, uh, sent a check in uh, to the church this week and when I got it, I thought about this verse, the gift of generosity. I FaceTimed him. I said, but you got the gift of generosity. And here's the thing about the gift of generosity. It doesn't matter the amount that you contribute. 
Paul doesn't say here that if you have the gift of generosity, you can only have it if you contribute or you live in this tax bracket. Anybody can have the gift of generosity. And some people, I pray that somebody would exercise that gift a little bit more. Somebody should say, we need a building. <laughs> exercise the gift of generosity. All right, the sixth one, the sixth uh, gift that he lays out that the church can contribute from is leadership. We need more leaders. In fact, I'll say it this way. Some of you that are still students should be teachers by now. Some of you that are still immature in the faith should be leaders by now. Because we need more leaders. Actually, leaders comes through discipleship. Some of you need to, 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 to give yourself to discipleship so that you can grow to become leaders. And Paul doesn't just say lead. He says lead with zeal. Don't be lazy in your leadership. Lead with passion. Lead with diligence. So he doesn't just tell you to lead, but he says, nah, you, can, you can't lead passively, but you got to lead with some initiative. The, the, the seventh gift that he lists out his acts of mercy. I hope y'all are rocking with me. I have no clue if you are, but hope you are. Acts of mercy. You know, acts of mercy means it's a gift that you see somebody that is hurt and broken and you jump in and you provide help. That's a gift of mercy. It's really the gift of caring. People with the gift of mercy don't care how much it's going to cost them, how much they have to sacrifice of their time. Their goal is to make sure that others are helped. So when they see a single mother that is struggling, they jump in and help. When they see a family that has been impacted by the pandemic, they jump in and help. When they see a family that has lost a family member and they see them grieving, they go over the house and they clean up or they provide a meal or they do something because they have the acts or the gift of mercy. People with the acts of mercy or the gift of mercy don't wait for the church to create a hardship fund. They got their own hardship fund. Who can I bless today? Who can I help today? Who is hurting? And many of you got that gift. Well, my wife had... Um, she had multiple back surgeries in 2018. In fact, in one month, 10 days apart, she had two back surgeries. And we as a body, as, 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 a, as a house, as a home, my wife and my two boys got to experience acts of mercy. When I tell you food just kept coming and coming, we didn't have, have room in our refrigerator because you guys were contributing because you saw that we were hurting, saw that we were in need. So that one of our, the, the main member of our house was down and you guys jumped in. Acts of mercy. Okay, here's the question you should be asking. Those are all seven gifts that he lays out. Here's the question I want to answer and then we'll, we'll, we'll land the plane. How does a person discover his spiritual gifts? I know you're asking it. I've got to ask that question a lot. How do I discover my spiritual gifts? Yes, you can do a spiritual gift inventory. I'm not fully against them, but I'll, I'll caution us. If we do spiritual gift inventory, sometimes it'll say, hey, this is your gift. And then you don't open yourself up to the possibility that you might have multiple gifts. And there might be multiple things that God wants to do in you. So you learn your gifts best by serving. You jump in the church and you find out what you're good at. You say, what, what do you need? Let me jump in and do that. You need hospitality. Let me jump in. But what do you need? And you, you find your gifts out by actually contributing and helping in the church. Also, allow your pastors to be able to help evaluate your spiritual gifts. I'll say it this way. This church would not be planted here. I know this is more teachy than I'm normally am. This church wouldn't be planted here if there was not a group of elders in Philadelphia that saw a gifting that I didn't even see and then invest in it. And pull it out and give me opportunities to mess up and tell me, hey, go preach. And then that Monday, sit down and say, hey, here's the things that you could have done better. Pastors that evaluated me and helped me to develop the local church must be the breeding ground for where gifts are discovered, flourished, and developed. That's what the local church must be. Too many of you are letting your gift lie dormant. This is your gift right here. There's so many of you that your gift has collected dust. Your gift is in the corner somewhere. You've walked away from it. Or you've allowed your gift to flourish in corporate America while the church lays handicapped. While the church is impaired, we need help. And you got what we need. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for the giftings that you have placed inside of each person. I'm confident, oh God, that there's not a person that's watching right now that doesn't have some type of spiritual gift. So Father, I pray that you would stir up the gift. That you would help people to realize that we are not as a body what we could be because too many of us are just logging on. Even as I hear Josh play, I hear gifts. I feel gifts flowing down. So Father, may 2021 be the year that we find out what we're good at. Father, would you encourage somebody and give somebody confidence that feels like they don't have a gift? Help them to realize that you've wired them some way. That there's something that they're good at. There's something that they can contribute. There's not a person that doesn't have something in them that you'll use. Some of us are hands and some of us are feet and some of us are eyes. Some of us are mouths. And so, Father, would you help us to play our part? But help us not to play all parts. Because if I, if I could do everything, I wouldn't be able to fulfill verse 3. I know I lack humility. But you say, nah, I'm going to just give you one or two or three. Because I'm, I still need you to be in a place of neediness. I still need you to be in a place where you need me. Father, I pray for your church, not just Epiphany Church. I'd be remiss if I only prayed for our church. But I pray for every blood-bought local church in this world that you would get believers that are in that area to plug in. Father, I hate to see that churches are dying. I hate to see that buildings are closing. And yeah, I I, I know some of it is your will. I, I get it. I get it. I understand. But some of it is just because we didn't have the people that brought their giftings to the church. We didn't have the person that had the gift of generosity to make sure that the bills were paid. Father, would you do a work in our hearts? It's in Christ's name we give all glory. Amen.